Um, I just want to talk generally about uh, data management and data repositories. This is going to be very general, so uh, I hope it won't be too, too lowly pitched. Um, so uh, in thinking about what to try to talk about today, I decided to go back to the pre-proposal and see what we said about data management. And I was happy to see, to be reminded that uh, it's right up there in the, uh, among the first, uh, among the top three of our, um, our learning, distinctive learning goals. So ensuring effective data management for long-term data discoverability, access, and future uses. And we've actually talked quite a bit about that today in the, the discussions here. Uh, why do we do that? Well, uh, one reason, not the only reason, but one reason is um, we're required to do that. And, you know, in fact, I think this is one of the reasons that, that NSF has decided to put some money, push some money in this direction, and to, uh, and in all of its, uh, you know, current um, requirements include data management as an important part of the outcome of, uh, of research that's being done. But, it's not the only one, and it wasn't the first one, and uh, there's a lot more uh, requirements uh, than even that listed here. But there has certainly been an, an uptick in this kind of in this kind of activity. So, what that means is, really, from the very beginning of a research project, you need to think about the end game. Where will the data that you produce, whether it's new data, whether it's reused, old data. Uh, how will that flow out of your project and into some place where it is safe and where it can be uh, cared for and accessed and reused in, uh, by future users, including potentially yourself? Um, and these are just some, some various uh, schematic of thinking about the creation, what's the act of use, uh, uh, what data do you select and, and evaluate again, exactly some of the things that we talked about in terms of what the learning objectives would be with the, uh, this particular uh, training program. Uh, and then, where will the data be deposited? Um, what kind of preservation is gonna be needed? And what kind of information is gonna be required for reuse? And we just mentioned metadata as a key kind of thing, and uh, come back to that uh, as well. In fact, very next slide. Um, so metadata is just descriptive information about the data, but it's essential uh, for people to actually reuse, reuse the data. And we've been talking a lot about documents, and documents are actually rich in metadata themselves. So, you know, if you, if you know who the author is, you have an important piece of metadata. If you know what year was published, that's an important piece of metadata. The title is an important piece of, of metadata. Uh, but there's also administrative information, there's technical information about what kind of file it is. Uh, there may be technical information about the um, research that's described in the document that is important to put into metadata. Uh, one of the reasons is keywords, uh, because that is still, even though there may be other, there are other ways of searching now, and, and potentially better ways of searching, uh, those still are uh, a key way for certain people to do at least a primary shift or a primary um, look through uh, what kind of data you get back on a search. And as we just said, for data sets, they're absolutely essential because the, the most attractive, the biggest, the most robust appearing data set, if you don't have the key, you are done. And so is the, so is all the work that went into that, into that research. So coding sheets or table-based metadata or some kind of descriptor of um, the data that's in the, the data sets is really key. Uh, we have uh, a couple of legacy databases that we're working on from a uh, huge archeological project actually up at Lake Roosevelt that the uh, Arizona State um, Archeological Research Center was involved with in the, the first five years, the first five years of the 21st century, the last five years of the 20th century. It was a really big project and uh, had some important results and there's a, a couple of huge data sets that we're trying to reconstruct. We actually 
have on hand some of the individuals that made those data sets and that used those data sets, and it is still a bare of a project to figure out what each of those uh, columns and rows mean for some of the variables that we're dealing with there. So um, I know firsthand uh, some of the problems with, uh, with data sets. Um, one of the questions that you will want to think about or that students will want to think about as they consider data management is where are you going to put the data? So there are different types of, uh, of data repositories. We've looked at some examples already today. Um, uh, the examples that I chose were domain repositories. So that would be a repository like TDAR, the Digital Archaeological Record, which is the one that we manage and develop at the Center for Digital Antiquity. Um, oftentimes they're preferred because of the richness and detail of the metadata that you can assign uh, two files that go into, uh, typically you can assign two files that go into domain repositories because they're set up to handle subject matter, certain subject matter. So we handle archaeology and cultural heritage data and uh, we're, our keywording and our metadata categories are set up to, uh, to try to deal effectively with that. But there are also institutional repositories. Uh, a lot of uh, universities, particularly big universities, have institutional repositories. Um, they are more generic, um, their metadata is not so detailed, but they are a place where faculty and students can put the data that they've created, whether they're documents or data sets or images, um, and they're relatively easy to use, although in talking to librarians, at least at ASU's librarians uh, who are responsible for the institutional repository there, they're also not much used. So um, th that is a bit of a drawback for institutional repositories. And then there. Are Maybe what these authors have referred to as virtual organizations, which uh, come together under maybe a, a big piece of equipment that is used by many organizations or many individuals and may retain the data that's generated by that, um, by that project or by that, um, uh, uh, that particular instrument. The, the one that I'm most familiar with in the examples here is the, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey which is a long-term, multi-million dollar project um, that includes a number of universities and uh, funded by the, the Sloan Foundation. And they keep as a repository the data that's generated by uh, researchers who work on, on that project. So that's just a, another kind of thing um, that, uh, again, in talking about data management is something that we want the students to be familiar with these various kinds of repositories. Why would you use a repository as opposed to just um, keeping things on your own hard drive? I, I think everybody knows the answer to that. Uh, these are some of the things that a repository to, does, a data repository does, that you won't do, even though you could. Um, you're probably not going to check your files uh, regularly to make sure that they haven't been corrupted. It might be hard for you even to detect if they had been corrupted if you didn't check in the right way. Uh, probably you're not going to be able to store your files with rich and uh, descriptive metadata, uh, although you could. These are all things you could do, but you probably won't, um, because you'll be on to the next research project, as opposed to focusing on curating the data that you already have. So that's why repositories can be a very good idea, a very important idea. And then the other kinds of uh, actions that uh, are ones that we take at uh, Digital Antiquity uh, for the data that are in, uh, that are in TDAR. And then um, another issue that uh, certainly students need to be aware of, and we've, all, we've already also talked about that here, and that is access and confidentiality. There are certain kinds of data that needs to be kept private, or at least to have access controlled. We come up against this all the time in dealing with uh, archeological data because um, there's certain kind of locational data, very specific locational data, that if it were generally available, might actually lead to the damage or destruction of archeological sites by people who would unfortunately go out illegally and unethically and immorally and uh, dig up what they think would be valuable artifacts and they destroy the archeological record in, in that process. So in our case, we do have a, a level, a set of levels of access. These kind of show that. Um, the metadata in TDAR is public. 
doesn't include specific locational information, but it lets people know that data exists. And if there's a confidential file linked to that metadata record, then they can be in touch with a contact person and potentially get access to the file itself or not, depending upon how that uh, discussion goes with the person who has actually um, created and uploaded the data. Um, then uh, I just wanted to show the workflow that we've developed uh, for the projects that we do for clients. So these, this would be an example where a, a public agency like the National Park Service, we used it as an example already, would come to us and say, we have uh, a lot of data from, for example, Casa Grande National Monument. We want to put it into TDAR where we can access it. These are the steps we would go through with them. We would identify what those materials were, we would work with them on creating a list of what the files were, where there were paper records, we would work on, with them on scanning them. We develop a metadata style sheet so that the metadata was consistent from document to document to document or for the images or for the data sets. Uh, then we would begin the processing of those, make sure the files were not corrupt, uh, were in the proper formats. Um, we'd work with them on the organizational structure for the archive create the resource pages, which are essentially the metadata pages, and then there's a review process before the project is actually final. So this is the kind of workflow that um, a project might look like, for example. And then finally, the last, uh, last slide, um, my objective here is to try to bring curation into the mix. So a lot of times, uh, scientists of various sorts, hum humanities, uh, hard sciences, natural sciences, think a lot about the research process, I uh, think maybe even more about the publications process, since in the academic world that is kind of the, the gold, that's the monetary uh, thing that we look at, but I think only recently have thought about the curation process and how that fits in, how they all fit in together. So this is the kind of, um, whether it's this diagram or other diagrams, this one I kind of like because it does show some of the details of uh, how it, who does what, and it's, it's a cycle. Uh, this doesn't stop at curation. You can see the material that's curated can also be available for, uh, for future uh, research. Stop. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank.